Grace to you, mercy and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Luke chapter 24, the whole chapter, is the record of that whole day's events on that first resurrection Sunday. And for a dead man, Jesus seems to have gotten around. I mean, after all, the first thing he does is exit the tomb. Then he takes a seven-mile walk, and then suddenly he appears in a locked room among his astonished disciples. These are not the actions of most dead men. But then, of course, Jesus, who died on the cross, had been raised from the dead. He had places to go and things to do, and so he went and did what needed to be done. To me, the most compelling part of this first Easter is that Jesus' first physical appearance recorded by Luke is on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Generally, when we, uh, this part of the chapter is discussed, most people want to focus on that exchange between Jesus and his two disciples. Jesus joins the two men on the road to Emmaus. They, uh, for whatever reasons, don't seem to recognize him. So he strikes up a conversation with them. So, what's this you're discussing so intently as you're walking along? And they just stood there, looking like they had lost their best friend. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, said, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened these last few days? To which Jesus replies, What things? And they said, Well, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet. Dynamic in word and work. He was blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. We had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. It's now the third day since it happened. But some of our women have completely confused us. You see, early this morning, they went to the tomb, but they couldn't find his body. And so they came back with a story that they had seen this vision of angels who had said that he was alive. And then some of our friends ran to the tomb to check things out and found it empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. And then he said to them, so thick-headed and so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see these things had to happen? that the Messiah had to suffer and only then could he enter his glory. And then starting with the beginning, with the books of Moses and all the way through the prophets, he pointed out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. Well, they came to the edge of the village where they were headed, and he acted as he was going on. But they pressed him, stay, have supper with us. It's nearly evening. The day is done. And so he went in with them. And here's what happened. He sat down at the table with them. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke and gave it to them. And at that moment, moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. But then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel like we were on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened the scriptures to us? just like those women at the tomb. And later on, when he would appear to his disciples in a locked room, Jesus confronts the disciples' sense of disbelief. And notice I said disbelief, not unbelief. It wasn't that the women or these two men or even the rest of the apostolic band refused to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Their minds simply couldn't grasp what was happening. The angels had to remind the women at the tomb what Jesus had said. Here, Jesus on the road to Emmaus had to do the same thing with Cleopas and the other guy. And then when he appears to everyone else later, we're told that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. But did you hear it? 
I mean, it was subtle. You may have missed it. That repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name from, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Think about it. If you and I had said that thing, we would have probably said beginning at Jerusalem. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus specifically says beginning from Jerusalem. Just like in the English language, he had two different words he could have used. At or sto in the Greek or from or apo. And he chose the latter. Jesus goes from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, at first sight, this probably isn't all that impressive. But consider this. Jerusalem and the temple were the capital of the Jewish faith. Jerusalem represents the spiritual center of the faith. That early church is initially gathered at Jerusalem, but then they will later be instructed when Jesus will say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Did you notice that progression? From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Things may start in Jerusalem, and the church may have initially gathered at Jerusalem, but Jesus speaks in terms of a movement from Jerusalem. And more than that, Jesus himself moves from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. The journey of the gospel begins with a road march with Cleopas and the other guy. Now, what you're probably not aware of is that Emmaus, which is located in the Judean countryside, was a Roman garrison town. The Romans had constructed a fortress and maintained a garrison of soldiers in this town just outside of Jerusalem. So think now of the significance. Jerusalem is a spiritual center while Emmaus is a secular place. And the first thing that Luke records Jesus doing is walking with two disbelieving disciples from the spiritual center of the faith to a secular Roman garrison town. Before he appears before his disciples in a locked room, before he breathes on them or gives them their commission or their mission, mission, marching orders, before Jesus does any of the stuff that we readily recall from that first Easter evening, Jesus walks from the spiritual center of Jerusalem where the faith was forming to a secular Roman garrison where the witness to the faith is being experienced among the disbelieving. So what am I trying to get at with all this? Well, in watching Jesus walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, we're given the ideal that the church has always meant to be a movement of the gospel. And this is where we often get things turned all around. You say, we, when we say the word church, in our minds we picture a structure with stained glass windows and pews and all kinds of other church furnishings in it. And we say things like, I'm going to church. Or church starts at 8. Or church starts at 11. Do you see the problem here? You see, when we think and speak of the church like this, we relegate church to a place. And we settle in our places. And we focus on the spaces that we occupy in those places. The church, however, is not meant to be a place to settle. Or a space to occupy. The church is a calling from God to his people. The Greek word that we interpret as church is the word ekklesia, which when properly translated means a called out gathering. When God refers to his people as the church, he's not talking about where they gather, but what they do. You are my witnesses, he tells us. We are called out people, and we've been called out by God for a purpose. Now I know that most of us are familiar with the trans traditional translation of Matthew 28, what we call the Great Commission. But Greek is a different language, and it operates under a different grammar. The English makes it all sound like imperative, command words, but the Greek is written in participles, verbal adjectives. 
And so if we turn to Matthew 28, 18, but we read it with a Greek in our mind, it should sound something like this. And approaching them, Jesus said, Given to me is all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, as you are going, be making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatever I have command to you. And I, behold, I'm with you all the days until the completion of the age. Likewise, the other gospel writers speak of the purpose of the church in terms of movement when, for instance, St. Mark says, as you are going into the world, all of you proclaim the gospel to all creation. And we also hear uh, Jesus say in St. John's account, as the Father sent me, I send you. Participles and infinitives. Verbal adjectives, verbal nouns. These are the language of the church's purpose. Not in terms of being a place for the gospel, but in terms of being a movement of the gospel. And so Jesus begins his resurrection appearances on the road. From the spiritual center to the secular culture. He journeys with two of his disbelieving disciples, reminding them of all that the scriptures said that testified about him, whom they eventually recognized in the breaking of bread. And then note how today's gospel story ends. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, probably exactly where they had been earlier, and those who were gathered with them together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So next week, we're going to begin looking at the Acts of the Apostles, which is, if you think about it, sort of a travel log of that early church that gathers at Jerusalem, but eventually makes its way to Rome and beyond. In Jesus' stroll to Emmaus, we see that the journey begins, a movement of the gospel about the kingdom of God. So may the good Lord perhaps put a little fire in our bellies, move us from where we have settled to go where and be among whom he sends us with the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.